is no monarch, House of Windsor's over. Because you can't have an illegitimate commoner becoming the monarch. This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, where I'm especially pleased to have as my featured guest today one of the world's great revisionist historians, one of the world's leading iconoclasts. He's best known for his studies of the lineage of the royal family in the UK, which he has demonstrated not to be legitimate. He's the author of Hitler Was a British Agent, Gifting the United Nations to Stalin, New Zealand, A Blackmailer's Guide, and many other works. His name, Greg Hallett. Welcome, Greg, to The Real Deal. Thanks, Jim. It's been two years and 10 days since our last interview. And apparently I've died in the meantime. <laughs> Greg, I was very concerned, honest to God. I thought you'd been taken out by the royals because they were so upset with your exposés. And I'm very relieved to have you back on the air. Well, I was living in this cave for four months. Whole set of your books have been published. I want you to tell us all about it. There's an ample opportunity here. I want you to explain to us what you've been doing, what you've got now, and why everyone should be looking at your books. Wow. This is the box set. Right. And the S that we've used, which is showing through the front of the books as well, that's the signet ring of the Holy Roman Emperor Germanic. So they're all little hardcover books and they're all full color throughout. This is a five volume set on the Hidden yeah. King of England, is that right? Yeah, 1200 pages and over 700 photos. It took four years and I needed to prove the origin of kingship because the British and European royal families claim that their kingship stems from Jesus. And then religion tells us that Jesus died on the cross when he was like 33 in like AD 33, and he never married, he had no children. But historical documents and the high order secret society documents show that Jesus survived the crucifixion and married and had children. And also that there were two Jesuses. Queen Victoria spent a million pounds in her time on her genealogy and it dated back to Jesus and another Jesus who were third cousins. They were actually second cousins, but it was one generation removed. So they had the same great, great grandparents. And one Jesus went to England and another Jesus went to the Algarve in Portugal, and this cave is in the Algarve in Portugal. The Algarve is the whole south coast of Portugal. I spent four years discovering the origins of the true kingship of the United Kingdom, and I found Jesus' graves. And so I had a nap in them, which was actually really nice. It was a really nice energy. It's called macrocosm, microcosm where you feel at one with yourself and the small, which is the five, as well as the macrocosm, which is the six. So these were places where there was a vortex of energy. And I found 10 of these Jesus grave sites, and they were backed up by the foundations of buildings, religious ceremonies still practiced today, and codification in literature, film, statues, buildings, time bearing directions, the prime meridian, and law, common law and civil law, statute law, as well as the Royal Courts of Justice and St Paul's Cathedral in London. It was quite big, it was quite groundbreaking. And the biggest secret of the Catholic Church is that there are two Jesuses, and the Catholic Church knows this knows that there were two Jesuses, and they consider it their best-kept secret. And Pope Francis actually agrees with me 
that there were two Jesuses. When I was in Lisbon, having discovered some of the grave sites, his people were not only following us around and sitting in the same cafe and all wearing the same perfume, but they were also in the places already that we were going to in Lisbon. And when I got back to the hotel room, that same perfume was emanating out of the ensuite, which has got double glazed doors, which were closed, and double shutters. So there's no way for that perfume to get into the bathroom, but it was emanating out of the bathroom. So we were definitely being followed and located by Pope's people who were telling us through perfume that we were on the right track. This is utterly fascinating and startling, actually, Greg. I'm fascinated about the part of the Jesus who was crucified having survived and married. Can you tell us more about that, who he married and so forth? Yeah, well, the French word for initiation is lancement. So the higher the initiation, the longer the lance. So Jesus was reportedly, figuratively, up on a cross, getting pierced by a very long lance, which suggests that it was a very high initiation. And I think that the initiation was this, that Jesus was from a royal lineage. He's based in Galilee, just east of Jerusalem. And he was too much trouble for the Romans in and around Jerusalem. So they gave him another kingdom. And that kingdom was the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which then had a combination of names as a series of small kingdoms. So he needed a reputation to precede him to go to England to set himself up as king. And this all was done with Roman compliance and Roman escort, with a lot of Romans looking the other way, including Pontius Pilate, etc. So Jesus gets to the southeast coast of England under Roman military and diplomatic escort. And that's actually proven. The biggest secret of the Catholic Church is that there are two Jesuses. And the Catholic Church knows this, knows that there were two Jesuses, and they consider it their best kept secret. And Pope Francis actually agrees with me that there were two Jesuses. The Lord Mayor of London is laughing at the spears or lances. So Jesus arrived in southeast England. He arrived up the Medway, which is the tidal river going in south of the Thames. Jesus came to England. Yeah, there's a lot of legends about it. The second national anthem of Britain. And, and, and of course, this is post after the crucifixion. Which didn't happen to either of the Jesuses. If there was a crucifixion, a physical death, then it happened to someone else, which may have been a lookalike, and some people suggest it was Judas. I'm not sure whether it even happened. But he survived because he had a lineage, and that lineage claims to be the monarchs of the United Kingdom and of Europe. So Jesus arrives up the Medway, which is a tidal river, and the Medway used to circle right round England. So the whole southeast coast of England was an island, and then it was a tidal island, and then it was a spring tidal island, and then it silted up until in about 1955 it was dammed. And then in 1959 and again in 1969, it flooded, the Midway flooded over the dam and up to the top point of the stream is called Eden. And there's Eden Bridge, which goes over the stream, as in Garden of Eden. And the nearest local landmark is called Godstone. 
and the area was covered in giant golden oaks. And where precisely is this located, Greg? It's near the intersection of Surrey and Western East Sussex. That area, the whole tidal island of the southeast of England, was called Regney. And Regney was kingdom come. Regney was where all of the exilarchs of the conquered kingdom were taken. So, first of all, Jesus became king of Regni because his reputation preceded him, and he had such a good lineage. And then he took a walk along Pilgrim's Way. It's called Pilgrim's Way, and it's 44 miles to London to Southwark, right? Suffolk and Suffolk Cathedral. And Suffolk Cathedral marks, it's written Southwark, Suffolk. So Suffolk Cathedral marks where you walk south, south walk, down Pilgrim's Way to Regni, to this kingdom of the Exilarchs, or kingdom come, in Eden at Godstone. <laughs> and then Jesus took the ferry across the Thames and started to develop London, which was then called Trinovantum, which means splendid trinity. And then eventually the name was changed. He actually designed London. London was just a commune at the time. And later in about 360 AD, it became a walled commune. But London was designed and built in the shape of a lion, as in baby lion, as in Babylon, without the head. And Jesus was the head. And then he changed the name of Trinovantum, Splendid Trinity, to Londinium, which is Lion, Brood, Despicini, Virgin Mary. So that formed Londinium, which became London. And then he became the Mayor of London. And the Mayor of London has all the roles of the King within London and essentially within England. The Mayor of London does all the work of the King and the King just sits back. And today the Mayor of London does all the role of the King within England and the British Isles and even does overseas trips. So Jesus became Lord Mayor of London as in Jesus is Lord. And then Jesus became the King of England and the King of Scotland. And then the Catholic Church broke away from Jesus' teachings in 451 AD. And in the same year, the Catholic Church sent the Saxons in to Great Britain to remove any evidence of Jesus and his teachings. So the Catholic Church actually excommunicated itself from Jesus' teachings, Jesus' lineage, and Jesus' history. And then there were a lot of authors even up to like 1400 AD, who wrote as though they were writing in 800 AD and called themselves things like the Venerable Bede. And they were actually conspiracy writers. And their conspiracy writing was then taken as historical fact. And as a result, there's very little history in Great Britain prior to 451 AD, and there's very little history in Britain prior to 1066 when William the Conqueror came over. So Britain was essentially conquered and its history was wiped out and its culture was wiped out. So all the British really know about the history is bits and pieces from 1066 AD. In the time of William the Conqueror, that's all they know of there. Yeah, 66, and there's very little before that. So there were conquerors, there were a lot of conquerors successfully, successively that came over and destroyed the culture and history and artifacts of Britain. And there's a few that became uncovered from the 1666 Great Fire of London, which resulted in timber buildings being pulled down and then digging being done for the foundations of stone buildings. And that unearthed 
things like an effigy of John Marcy, where John Marcy is the name of Jesus' firstborn son. This is going to startle a huge percentage of the audience that views this program. Startle it. Yeah. There are two Jesuses. There's Jesus of England or Jesus of Britain. And then there was Jesus of the Olga, which is the coastal southern state of Portugal, which was its own kingdom. It used to be the kingdom of Portugal and the kingdom of the Algarves. So what I did was look at Google Earth and go, I need to go there. <laughs> and uh, I do as much research as I could on it. And the research that you can do on the internet is blah. It's really just confusing, go nowhere, blah. But when you get there and you live here and you talk to the locals and you find out local knowledge and you find out that in the Algarve there's three conflicting types of historian. There's the Miguelist Nazis, there's the Arabists, and there's the Christian Templars. And they've all got completely different versions and on top of that, Portugal was under fascist control until 1974. So when the historians wrote things, they would codify it. One of the ways they codified it is that if we had one page of information in a 100-page book, they would take four paragraphs out of that page and intersperse it a quarter way through, halfway through, and at the end of the book. So in order to find out what they were saying, you actually had to retype the book and reset the paragraphs to try and get some continuity to what they were saying. So the historians in Portugal were doing massive obfuscation to save their bacon until 1974, which is similar to what happened to England until 1066. So on top of that, you have to read several books and talk to the three different types of historians and go to the site and take photographs and measurements, ascertain whether what they were saying was true or it actually wasn't based on anything. Because when you got there and checked out their information, the physical site was so different from what they mentioned, it was absolutely worthless. <laughs> so, so in order to get beyond that, you actually had to look at the Portuguese historians' information in the light of they were alluding to something, but they definitely weren't saying it. And you had to look at what they were covering up and how they were covering up. So what I found through all of this obfuscation and the three different types of historians here, Miguel like Nazis, Arabists, and Christian Templars, was that the truth of the history in the Algarve was recorded in the buildings, especially in the foundations and the older buildings, and in the doorways. And often the doorways were moved within a building to allude to where Jesus' body had been moved to, because his grave in the Algarve was moved largely due to earthquakes and then when his body was located and it became a source of kingship, having the body of Jesus was a mark of kingship, there are all sorts of invasions in Portugal from 1807 to 1834. Right, there are three major wars here. And they're all after the remains of Jesus for the Algarve. So his body was moved and I used the codification and how the doors were moved from the outside on the north side to the inside on the south side, etc., to find out where his next burial site was. And also looked at the literature with things like they had a random ceremony where they would put candles on the inside of windows in all of the houses to celebrate something. But if you do that, you can't see out, right? Which means that people outside can move a body down the street at night or some remains and no one can see out because it's winter, the windows are closed and the reflection from the light on the window means that all the windows are effectively blacked out. 
So that's the sort of thing that gives you the date on the moving. And on top of that, the Algarve is covered in natural subterranean tunnels. So some of the movement was happening underground. Some of the so-called Templar atrocities never happened because the Arabs escaped down wells underground and walked underground for eight kilometres and escaped. It took a while, and then right at the end on Easter Friday, I found in Sylves the ceremony on Easter Friday where they carry vertical Joseph of Arimathea, a vertical Mary or Virgin Mary, and a horizontal Jesus in a coffin. That the way the coffin was presented was exactly the same way that I found his original gravesite. And the pathway they took, I mapped that out on Google Earth, and it was a direct allusion to the knowledge he had dating back to Babylon. Have you been able to trace a genealogy from Jesus forward? Queen Victoria did it. And post-publishing the books, I have begun, and could be part of the next book, I found that... Jesus of the Algarve's grandson was Empress Caesar Trajan. And Empress Caesar Trajan adopted his nephew Hadrian, who was the great-grandson of Jesus of the Algarve. And Emperor Hadrian adopted Antonio Pius, and he was the great-grandson of Jesus of England. And Antonio Pius had a daughter, and his daughter married Caesar Marcus Aurelius, and his biological son was Emperor Commodus. Commodus was the lineage of Jesus of England and Jesus of the Elgo. This is all so extraordinary, Greg. The Windsors therefore claim that they can trace their genealogy back to one or the other of the two Jesus? Well, the thing about the Windsors is that they're illegitimate, biologically illegitimate and bigamously born. And they have been since 1840. So they're really just a write-off family. They're a bunch of commoners usurping as royals who actually haven't been crowned and In their crowning, they haven't declared their true names. And their name, Windsor, was assumed in 1917, 17th of July. And prior to that, it was Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. And that was assumed on the 7th and 10th of February, 1840. That was a fake name as well because Queen Victoria's supposed first husband, Prince Albert, was not Prince Albert of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. He was Prince Albert of Saxony, which is a name given to illegitimates. And his mother had an affair, and the person she had an affair with, she ended up marrying, and he became a Count of Palsy. Prince Albert was illegitimate, and he was chosen from Germany because he was illegitimate. And Prince Albert didn't sire any of Queen Victoria's children. And Prince Albert was given the title Prince Consort Albert two and a half years after the last official child of Queen Victoria was born, Princess Beatrice. And giving the title Prince Consort Albert two and a half years after the last child was born was a public notice that Prince Consort Albert had not sired any of the children. And he died a few years later in 1861. He was actually murdered by mad which is medically assisted death. And Queen Victoria was married before she purportedly married the misnamed, mistitled Prince Albert. And she was married to the second in line to the British throne, who was blind Prince George of Cumberland, who became blind King George V of Hanover, who was also the Holy Roman Emperor Germanic. And... This is his signet ring. A signet ring is only this big. You know, you wear it on your finger and you impress it into wax 
official document. To, to show that that's your seal and only he wears it. And the signet ring that Lion Prince George of Hanover wore as the King George the Fifth of Hanover, his signet ring was Camelot. And Camelot means curved light. So if we look at that, there's the five books there, right? Take the signet ring and photograph it. Yeah. yeah. And then photograph it again and again. Yes. And again, and again. Yes. And again. Yes. And, and twice more. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 And, again. yes. and again. Yes. Again, right? Yes. And what we did is we, we put a signet ring on a bit of sellotape and then put it under natural light and then just turned it like five degrees, photographed it, turned it five degrees and photographed it. And every time we did that, we got a different color, right? Ah, fascinating. Yeah? And that color is curved light, and curved light is the meaning of Camelot. So this was Camelot's signet ring, effectively, essentially, or as well. And Camelot relates to Prince Arthur, King Arthur. And Prince Arthur is the one who pulls the sword out of the stone but it's the Philosopher's Stone. And what Prince Arthur does is he polishes the Philosopher's Stone so much, or so much, that he can pull a sword out of it, a sword of knowledge, and cut through all the bullshit. Are you suggesting pulling the sword out of the stone is more than a myth? No, I'm saying it's an allegory. An allegory. Yeah. Polishing the stone means that you come to grips with the knowledge so much that you can pull information out and that information acts like a sword to destroy all usurpers. Like the House of Windsor is a family of usurpers. They're fake monarchs, they're pretenders. They're illegitimate, bigamously born all the way. And they have to be extremely unhappy with you, Greg Hallett. No, I actually think they're just biding their time because all of this has been predicted. J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan, used to read Peter Pan to Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret when they were children. And Peter Pan is an allegory of Marcus Manuel, who is the subject of these books. And Marcus Manuel is Queen Victoria's firstborn and only legitimate child. So Princess Elizabeth absolutely knows about these stories and she's been expecting this whole story to come out and break from anywhere from the 19th of September 2012 to 2019. And you're talking about the Queen herself? Well, the, the person who calls herself Queen Elizabeth II, but she's actually not a royal. She's a commoner and she's never been crowned and she's a usurper. It's called flat lie royal, where you've got someone who's not a royal on the crown. Yeah, so she's just holding the position until we take it. So there's no prospect that Prince William, for example, who seemingly signed out of his opportunity to accede to the crown, but may be induced to reassume that role, is actually going to ever be crowned King of England. You know, well, they rearranged the order of secession to put William ahead of Charles. And it's only because William has suggested that he did not want to become king that Charles has been resurrected as a prospect. No, they're just trying to keep themselves in the news. They're fakes. And Queen Elizabeth is illegitimate. And Prince William is illegitimate. And I can prove to you that Prince William is illegitimate because we toppled the King of Spain. Let me get clear on this, Greg. Was not William sired by Charles and Diana, or was William sired by 
Diana and someone else. Yeah, William was conceived by Diana and sired by King Juan Carlos of Spain. And I take it Harry, of course, is the son of, is it Hewitt, you know? Yeah, well, Prince Harry is not a prince, and he's either the son of James Hewitt or some other ginger nut. I've assumed James Hewitt, he looks so strikingly like him, and Diana obviously had a great fondness for him. Yeah, Diana was quite loose. (laughs) Well, she felt neglected by her husband, did she not? I mean, I think she did not feel overly loyal to him as a consequence. And all this Camilla business was, of course, quite an absurdity, even a circus. Yeah, well, Prince Charles and Camilla had a child together when they were teenagers. What happened to him or her? Uh, Him. He became a telecommunications engineer and moved to Australia, and his name is Simon Charles Day. So he's still around today. Well, since I've noticed the public that Simon Charles Day is the illegitimate son of Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles, He's disappeared. Really? Yeah. Am I six? I have no idea. No idea. Well, that's very troubling, isn't it? But the royals are going to clean up after themselves, aren't they? I mean, you would think they'd want to suppress the information you're bringing forward in your five books. Well, this is all predicted in the tradition received, which is the high order knowledge is passed down. Queen Victoria used psychics from within a year of her crowning. She was big on psychics, and she virtually founded and funded unofficially the Ghost Club Society, which became the British Psychic Society. And she had psychics working with her, and Victoria herself was a sora, which meant that she was a female fratter. She was a female into the secret Rosicrucian knowledge, which is the knowledge of the long year, which is the 2160 year, which really, you know, kind of goes from zero AD to now, you know, plus or minus 100 years. So we're in that same long year, which uh, Rosicrucians make their predictions in for the long year was Freemasons are more involved in the century, the 100 year, which actually goes from the 97 year to the 97 year, like 1897 to 1997 to 2097. So Queen Victoria was a Sora and she had some Rosicrucian knowledge and she employed psychics and she recorded her psychic knowledges in familiar French High German, English, invisible writing, royal marks, paintings, landmarks, nations boundaries, the timing of nations boundaries, etc. And then spread these around. And one of the codifications in the it's a Rosicrucian codification was that this information would be uncovered by a Lemurian and written up by a Lemurian. And a Lemurian is someone from New Zealand or Australia or Pacific Islands and I'm from New Zealand. So I was fulfilling, you know, so like I was kind of allowed because it's the only one that stuck up my hand from New Zealand or Australia. And actually, when I was born, my mother told me this when I was about 31, she said, the psychic woman came to the house and said, your son just born will achieve something big in the world, or large, one of those big words. So it seems to have been predicted. And then what Queen Victoria got to me was a letter written by her hand in familiar French, written in invisible writing saying, assemble and claim it. Well, what's the current state of the royal family? It seems to be in considerable disarray. Yeah, the House of Windsor is completely falling apart. And even the genealogical websites 
have comments on this saying uh, the House of Windsor is not expected to last beyond the next generation, which would be William. And I spoke to a Russian prince and he said, British royal family began with a William and a Harry and ends with a William and a Harry. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah, yeah. As I recall, Greg, you actually went to the PM and delivered uh, documents related to the lineage of the crown uh, demonstrating that the present occupants were not the legitimate occupants of that office. Yeah, and that actually caused the proposed change to the laws of succession. Yes, 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 yes. So under our belt so far, we have been the causation or effecting the change to the laws of succession, and that is an admission by the entity called Elizabeth II and the House of Windsor that they are illegitimate. That's what the laws of succession are. They are an admission that the House of Windsor is illegitimate. That is all it is. And they are masquerading that the laws of succession are about equality for a religion, allowing a Catholic to become a monarch, and equality for gender, allowing a firstborn female to become a monarch. But that's all cover. And what they're actually saying in the proposed change to the laws of succession is that only the children of Charles, Prince of Wales, can be a monarch. Now, Charles, Prince of Wales, didn't sire Prince William or Prince Harry. Charles, Prince of Wales, sired a child with Camilla Parker Bowles on Camilla Parker Bowles' 18th birthday. Charles was 16. And that child was... Simon Charles Day, who was born, I think it was 5th of April, 1965. And then Prince Charles had a child with a maid servant girl in Balmoral Castle. And that was relayed to me by British SAS. That's a rather lascivious aspect to all of this, Greg. How young was she? Who? The maid with whom he sired this second illegitimate child. 18. 18. Yeah, she was 18 and it was in 1967, child born in 1968. So Charles might have been 18 or 19. Have you seen photographs of her? Is she quite fetching? No, I haven't seen her. But I have seen a picture of Jumbo the elephant with the very big ears. Have you seen that? Well, Greg, this is very disturbing. You're saying that a legitimate heir, given the revision of the laws of succession, was in Australia... He was the illegitimate offspring of Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles, and now he has disappeared. Yeah. Uh, given the change in the laws of succession, that would seem to be a rather big deal. Well, see, the reason we forced Queen Elizabeth to create the proposed change to the laws of succession for her to publicly admit and acknowledge that her family are completely illegitimate. And... In the proposed change to the laws of succession, they were sent out as, let's say, a 20-page document to all the Commonwealth nations to get their approval. And their approval was expected before the last 80 pages of the document was written, so sight unseen. And in that unseen 80 pages that are pre-signed, Elizabeth II wanted to verify some marriages and annul other marriages, thus rendering illegitimates legitimate and legitimates illegitimate. Right? So she wanted to rewrite history. And justices in the United Kingdom actually stated and found that the proposed change to the laws of succession is unlawful. So... Because Prince Charles has two illegitimate children and did not sire Prince William or Prince Harry, and the proposed change to the laws of succession says that only the children of Prince Charles can become the monarch. There is no monarch. House of Windsor is over because you can't have an illegitimate commoner becoming the monarch. 
Wasn't that done on the basis of the presumption that the public would believe that William and Harry were children of Charles, even though Harry looks nothing like him? And while William may bear a passable resemblance, you, you have explained that he's in fact not Charles' son. It's like this. This is Charles William. Hi, I'm the father. Hi, I'm the son. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know. The for example, no, are so different. Yeah. There's no resemblance at all, not at all, not in the least. Prince Charles and Prince William have the passing resemblance that they are both white males. That's not quite a lot of resemblance. No, there's no resemblance at all. Just the black and white version, right? Yeah. Here's King Juan Carlos of Spain, aged 24, and here's Prince William, aged 28. Quite a similarity there, including the nose, the, the ears, nose, the general the shape, the, the, face, the, the ears, the jawline, the forehead. Yeah. Striking. Yeah. Not only that, King Juan Carlos's wife and William's wife, Kate, are nearly identical. Kate. Kate and uh, Juan Carlos's wife, Sophie. That's fascinating, yeah. Greg. That's yeah. fascinating. What do you take of this resemblance of the wives? It's just genetic. That's genetic just coincidental. Preference. Like the preference of men for women with a certain look. Yeah, yeah. But the, the father and son look, the ears on King Juan Carlos and Prince William are identical. They're actually a match that would pass a phrenology test as the same person. Right. That's utterly fascinating. Uh, uh, yes, Prince, you have other photographs comparing Charles with William to show their dissimilarity? When we brought this out, here's a photo here of purportedly Charles and Diana yeah. at yeah. King Carlos's house. In actual fact, what's happened is we brought this story out and we used this picture that is actually Juan Carlos there and that is actually Charles there, right? And the House of Windsor swapped their heads to make Charles look like the center of the picture. Really? Yeah. yeah. The first swaps were cruder than Harvey Lee Oswald's chopping and the shadow going in the wrong direction, right? Yes, so they, yes. they, they swapped these two heads because this is actually Juan Carlos here with the head swapped, and this is actually Prince Charles sitting to one side, and this is actually Prince William and Prince Harry on the knee of Juan Carlos. With Charles is sitting over here forlorn going, I'm just a gooseberry. I'm nothing to do with this relationship. Who are to the right of Juan Carlos? Well, that's, that's Juan Carlos's son there. there. And below her, and his wife. Uh, Juan Carlos's wife there, who's essentially looking up to Juan Carlos, but they put Prince Charles's head there. <laughs> Fast. The House of Windsor is absolutely... And here's another photo where they haven't swapped the heads, and there's... King Juan Carlos with Prince William on his lap. And there's Diana with Prince Harry. And there's Charles to one side as a gooseberry. Right? And Charles, of course, must be aware that the children are not his. He's absolutely aware. He's, he's completely, utterly, and totally aware. And he's also aware that his mother is an illegitimate commoner. So what happened in... July 1996, is a very wealthy European aristocrat, female, Lilibet. She ran a dinner. Um, Juan Carlos King Spain was there, Diana was there, Charles was there, and a whole lot of other aristocrats. And it's all recorded in intelligence. And Lilibet stood up and said to Prince Charles, you are nothing. You're not a prince. Your mother's a maid. She's a maid. You're not the Prince of Wales. You are nothing. Right? And, and Charles went like this. And this was the Queen saying this to Charles? No, no, this is a really wealthy woman in Spain. It was in Marbella in July 1996. Who was it again, Greg? Lilibet. So it's a really wealthy, aristocratic woman in, I think it's Marbella. My bad, my bad. In Spain. She just it's happened called, to be in possession of the accurate information. Yeah, this is called the Soiree of Puddles. The dinner was called the Soiree of Puddles. 
And so Charles is denounced. He's actually dethroned there before he becomes a monarch. And he's dethroned as the Prince of Wales at this dinner in July 1996. And Princess Diana's there going, you know, she's all dressed up, looking in the finery, etc. She's got all the jangly bangles on. And she goes, oh, crap. I'm married to a commoner, right? So she goes around and has as many affairs as she can to expose Charles as the son of a maid. Elizabeth II is the daughter of a maid. She's not a royal. She's a commoner. So the person you call Queen Elizabeth II is a commoner, and her image is not on the pound notes or the pound coins or any of the cents. Whose she image is on those? Elizabeth is a commoner. Whose image is on the pound and so forth. I mean, was it just someone who stood in for her? No, it's something like Mrs. Stamford. Something like that. So this is really? Prince William's biological natural father is King Juan Carlos of Spain, and in exposing that, I toppled the King of Spain. Let me take you back to, to yeah. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. There's been a lot of speculation that Albert, in fact, was somehow involved in the entire history of Jack the Ripper. I know you're well acquainted with this or not, because the suggestion has been, for example, that Albert had married a woman who was a commoner. There were like five witnesses to the marriage and that the surgeon attendant to the queen was issued the responsibility of destroying all of them, whereas the woman he married was incarcerated in an insane asylum. Does any of this ring any bells for you? Yeah. Prince Albert, who was married in a bigamous marriage to Queen Victoria, he died on the 14th of December, 1861. And the way he died is he caught a bit of a cold. <laughs> So his doctors put him in a bed in Windsor Castle, chained him to the bed and left the windows open so that the winter winds came in and he got pneumonia and died in the blue room at Windsor Castle. The blue room? Uh, yeah. Well, now, named. Um, well named. Now his official son was Bertie Prince of Wales who became King Edward VII. And his official Firstborn son was Prince Eddie, who was involved in the Jack the Ripper murders. And his official secondborn son became King George V, who reigned from 1910 to 1936. George V of England was actually the illegitimate son of Tsar Alexander III of Russia. And I've just done the ship manifest and escort vessel manifest at the time of the conception of George, who became King George the V. And his purported father, King Edward the Seventh, was in another country, nine days sailing away at the time of conception and 21 days either side of that conception. And the person who was there was Sarovich Sasha Alexander who was the younger brother of Grand Duke Nicholas II of Russia. And what happened was Tsarevich Sasha Alexander conceived a child with Alexandra, Princess of Wales, of England, and then murdered his older brother, Grand Duke Nicholas II, and became first in line to the Russian throne. And George V, of England was conceived in a black moon month where there are two no moons or two new moons in the same month. And they're quite rare. And the Russians and Scandinavians and Danish and Wiccans really value a monarch that is conceived in a black moon month with two new moons in the same month. So it was the Danish and Russians who were behind the Jack the Ripper murders to remove first in line Prince Eddie because they wanted the second in line, second born, to become the king and became King George V. 
And Prince Eddie's death was faked on the 14th of January, 1892, and he was moved to Glamis Castle in Scotland where he had the world's longest bed and breakfast, which was over 33 years from 1892 to 1933 plus. And he was photographed in Glamis Castle by a female relative. And the condition for the world's longest bed and breakfast was that one of the children of Glamis Castle would marry the monarch. And that was Elizabeth Bell's lion. So Elizabeth Bell's lion, she was born in 1900, and she was first engaged to the person who became, or well, David, Prince of Wales, who became Edward VIII, who was never crowned. And within a week of the engagement, Edward VIII told Elizabeth Bell's lion that he was going to abdicate because he knew that his father, George V, V was reigning falsely because George V's old brother, Prince Eddie, was still alive. So that's why Edward VIII was never crowned. So what Elizabeth Bowes Lyon did a week after her failed engagement with David Prince of Wales, who became Edward VIII, she was engaged to George, Duke of York, who became King George VI. King George VI had an IQ of 67 and 66 was retarded. And he had knock knees, terrible starter, he was an alcoholic and a chain smoker. So Elizabeth Bowes Lyon said, ye gad, I'm not having sex with him, I'm not going to marry him. So she brought her maiden, which is the whipping boy, and the whipping boy had been with her uh, since 1907, doubling up in photographs. Um, the whipping boy was one of a twin from Waterford and County Waterford in Southern Ireland. And um, the, she was essentially the maid. The whipping boy was the maid to Elizabeth Bell's line. And the whipping boy maid became engaged to George Duke of York, who became King George VI. And even she refused to have sex with George VI. She had one child with him. So Elizabeth Bell's line's maid married the person who became King George VI. And they had one child together by artificial insemination. That was a son, and it was epileptic and left to die on the gurney. And thereafter, the near retarded, chain smoking, alcoholic, knock kneed stutterer, George VI, was removed out of the royal gene pool in terms of breeding and replaced with another illegitimate royal, Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill was the illegitimate child of King Edward VII, who was himself illegitimate. And Winston Churchill donated the sperm by artificial insemination to King George VI's wife, who was Elizabeth Bowes Lyon's maid. And the resulting child was born above a pub, above the Coach and Horses pub in Mayfair. And that child is a commoner, given the name Elizabeth. And you know that commoner, illegitimate Elizabeth today as the uncrowned Queen Elizabeth II. Who's actually the child of Winston Churchill. Yeah. Hey. This Princess Margaret, yeah. It's yeah. just astounding. It's just astounding what you have disentangled, Greg. I'm just in awe. Well, Queen Elizabeth II, or the entity known as Queen Elizabeth II, actually acknowledges me as her superior. Meaning genetically or in terms of lineage or in terms of proximity to the legitimate crown? No, no, no. She knows that she is my charge. Explain what you mean by that. The common entity known as Queen Elizabeth II acknowledges that she is my charge, that Officially, as soon as she abdicates, she is my charge, right? I'm in charge of her. I'm in charge of ensuring that she lives comfortably to the end of her natural days. And you come to be in that position by virtue of? It was given to me on the 7th of October, 2011. So that's about three years and three months. This was designated that you should have yeah, this response? Yeah. Queen Elizabeth II was given to me on the 7th of October 2011 on the condition, basically, as soon as she abdicates. And 
She abdicated at Chogham Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting exactly 21 days later on the 28th of October 2011. This would make you, in effect, her executor or as though you yeah. had power of yeah. attorney over her? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Extraordinary. She's just a commoner, but yeah, but there's quite a few extraordinary things that have happened, like the abdication of Queen Beatrix of Holland. I was in Holland at the time, and two and a half days before she announced she was going to abdicate, an internal affairs immigration woman in Holland came and sat down next to me at a bar, I think it was a Friday night, and started quizzing me on why I've been in Holland for so long. And, you know, I've only got a New Zealand passport, so I'm only supposed to be in Europe for like three months. And I've been here five years, a bit of a space away, but I've been here five years. And she asked me what I was doing, so I told her what I was doing, and I verbally gave her my titles, and she said, I believe you, and... Two and a half days later, Queen Beatrix announced she was going to abdicate. I thought that was just something, you know, it was just something on the back of my mind. And then I announced all this information about King Juan Carlos of Spain being the biological father of Prince William of England. And King Juan Carlos of Spain was also the president of the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund. So his role was to protect wildlife. In 2012, he went to Africa and shot big game and dislodged his hip or did something with his hip. And then in 2014, he went to Africa again and broke his leg. And the leg represents kingship, which represents a broken kingship. And the kingship of Spain was broken from 1931 to 1972, I think it was, or 75, when King Juan Carlos got back onto the throne. Basically, with the, it was near simultaneous with the death of General Francisco Franco of Spain, who was a Nazi. And the Nazi General Francisco Franco of Spain actually raised King Juan Carlos, first year as his son. So there was Nazi tendencies there. Now, Princess Diana, Diana, Princess of Wales, had four affairs with King Juan Carlos of Spain. There's three that are very known, including August 1986, but she actually had an affair with King Juan Carlos of Spain that resulted in the conception of Prince William. And Prince William and King Juan Carlos of Spain look identical. Strikingly alike, yes. You know, the heights and... Well, is William aware um, that... Uh, the area around here that you're really going to look at is, is a real telltale, but their nose, their forehead, their ears, their jawline, their hairline, their eyes, skin colour. Is, is William aware that Carlos is his father? Oh, absolutely. He goes on holidays there and they hang out together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Diana, you're saying on four different occasions she had prolonged affairs or stayed with uh, Carlos. Yeah, and, and Prince Charles was such a gooseberry. She, um, one of the affairs, she actually took Prince Charles along. She even took Prince Charles along on some of these dalliances. Yeah, they used to go out and rule the together. She must have had much more passion for Carlos than she ever felt for Charles. Yeah, well, you know, I wouldn't describe Charles as passionate or... No, oh, I know, I know, or even very attractive or whatever, yes. He's not attractive, he's not sexy. He's, tell, me, tell, me, tell me more about Diana's escapades. Diana had an affair with King Juan Carlos of Spain that resulted in the conception and birth of Prince William of England. Now, Prince, Prince Charles and Princess Diana's marriage was planned so that they had another couple of days left in a black moon month with two no moons, which is an auspicious time to conceive a king. And they did not conceive in that time. And then with the conception of Prince Harry, there was another auspicious time to conceive. So what Princess Diana did was conceive five months beforehand so that even if she had an abortion, there was no way that she could conceive again in that auspicious month. So Diana absolutely purposefully sabotaged the conception of Prince William and 
purposely sabotaged the conception of Prince Harry. And she did this for a couple of reasons. She absolutely hated the House of Windsor and the British royal family. And she was a agent. She was an intelligence agent. She was a honey trap. She uh, was an a intelligence agent. agency for uh, a honey was, bot for what agency would she have been working for? Princess Diana was an intelligence agent for her father, the Rothschilds. Diana was a Rothschild. That's rather disturbing, all things considered, Greg. <laughs> Given the vast reach of the Rothschilds, you know, the worldwide empire and the power they exert, that's really quite extraordinary that Diana was a Rothschild. Yeah, well, Diana's mother, Frances, the Honorable Frances Burke Roche, she was known to have a long-standing affair with Sir Jimmy Goldsmith, who was a Rothschild. And Diana looks exactly like Sir Jimmy Goldsmith, has the same flashing eyes, has the same long fingers, same expressions and mannerisms, and she looks identical to Jimmy Goldsmith's three daughters, one of whom is Jemima Goldsmith, who married Imran Khan. And Jemima Goldsmith and Princess Diana were best friends and half-sisters. So when they ran around, they just looked like sisters because they were sisters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Greg, Diana seemed to me to be a rather extraordinary person because she took her position, her celebrity, and put it to the benefit of the world by, for example, opposing landmines. And that, of course, won her friends but also and admiration, but also powerful enemies. Yeah, well, no good deed goes unpunished. Yes. <laughs> Do you believe that played a role in her eventual assassination? Oh, absolutely. Are there less landmines now, or is there oh, less? Oh, yes, 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 yes. How did her relationship with Fodi, how did that play out? Was the royal family upset that she might have such a serious interest in a Muslim? They just wanted to kill her, and Dodie was the boyfriend at the time. Yeah, Dodie Farad, yeah. Well, you've got to consider that the, the most indicative thing to Princess Diana's death was that Lilibet had exposed Princess Diana in Marbella in Spain in July 96, and Diana was murdered in August 97. All right. And yeah. the, the assassination attempt failed, and then she was beaten to death or suffocated or whatever in the ambulance. Right. And the ambulance was about 85 minutes late arriving yeah. to the hospital. Yes. Right? Yes, an hour and 45, actually. Yeah. It took an hour and 45 when it should have taken 10 or 15. Yeah, and it appears she was beaten to death to ensure she had sufficient internal injuries that she would die even mm -hmm. though when they got her to the hospital, she was still alive. She only survived about 10 minutes longer. Yes. But the interesting thing that happened, the Navy actually acknowledged that I toppled the King of Spain. And what happened was I went into a pub in the center of the Olga, a place called Cavuero, which is actually pronounced Cave Oero. It's where my cave is. Cave Oero. <laughs> and even the locals don't know where it is. But I've got the picture hanging up in a couple of the bars. You know, so people go, wow, someone lived in a cave. So I, I went into the Carbura bar on Friday the 19th of April. And someone who's connected to British and Portuguese royalty, I've spoken to a few times, he said to me, what do you think is going to happen next? And I said, the King of Spain is going to abdicate. And then I moved into the sea cave on the 29th of May, 2014. I was on Thursday night, and then I used the offcut for the boardwalk they were building to build a bed base. And the floor was just up and down about a metre difference. You know? And then I, I used the offcuts of the boardwalk to build a bed, and then the next day I built a proper bed, a full-length bed. And then the same day I went and got an air bed, put it on top, and I had a place with, a frontline place with, oh, you know, views, 180 almost degree views. And I was eight meters from the sea, glistening blue water, absolutely sunny, really warm at night, didn't need any bedding. It was just 
fantastic. So I just finished the book, so I was just getting rid of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and electricity and just absolutely de-stressing, defocusing my eyes. You know? you look at the distance in the sky to do that. So that was the Thursday and the Friday. And then on the Saturday morning, King Juan Carlos announced that he was going to advocate. That's the 31st of May, 2014. And I didn't have any electricity or Wi-Fi, didn't have a radio or anything in my car, no TV. So it was all just a surprise, you know. But at the time that he announced he was going to advocate, the Portuguese Navy came up to the sea cave. They actually came up to the sea cave. I mean, like this is a boat. You know? <laughs> Doing two knots, right? Stop. Coming, for, coming for you? Yeah, they just stopped. They stopped there, right? Right there. About 225 meters offshore. And it was just at the distance that I couldn't read the name on the boat or the number. And then they sent a Zodiac off the deck. The guy got on it and came right to my cliff face and he went along the cliff face and he had a look at it to see if he could climb up my cliff face, which is 14 meters high, it's 40 feet high, vertical cliff face from the, from the sea. The tide goes up and down about four meters. So it was really about 12 to 16 meters, depending on the tide. And he realized that he couldn't come up the cliff face. He went back to the Portuguese Navy ship. And then they moved at one knot to about there and then stopped again. So the whole time they were stopped was 35 minutes. And my Gmail address for the seven years prior to that is, and has been, still is, Prince of New Spain. And by my cell phone, they can track the Gmail Prince of New Spain. So King Juan Carlos of Spain is abdicating. I've got the Gmail Prince of New Spain. I've exposed him as the father of Prince William of England. He's announcing he's going to abdicate. And the Portuguese Navy turns up for 35 minutes, doing two knots, stops, moves at one knot, stops. No. And that Navy ship, and no Navy ships turned up again until my last day in the cave, which was the 28th of September. And then when they did that, they did it in such a way that they turned the boat so I could read the tailplate and get the tailgate number of the Coast Guard naval ship was P1165, which is actually code for the work we're doing. Six and five is 11, and 1165 means NN, which is Marcus Manuel. 6-5 means macrocosm, microcosm, which is the work I did, discovering the work that Jesus did and what their graves were about, the buildings, etc. So that was interesting. So that was the 30th, Saturday, 31st of May. And then I didn't know at this stage that Juan Carlos had abdicated. So I went down to the same Carbuero bar and the same guy was there from six weeks earlier. And uh, he stands up, you know, and he goes, kudos to you. I go, what do you mean? He said, King Juan Carlos of Spain has announced he's going to abdicate. You, you said that six weeks ago. And no one else in the bar had heard it, so I didn't really believe him. And, but it was that night, you know, that we found out he was going to abdicate. And the same guy said, his name's Mike, uh, Mike Stewart. Uh, he said, when do you think he's actually going to abdicate? And I said, well, the official date of the copyright date for the publication of these books here is the 4th of July, 2014. So I reckon he'll abdicate a month and a day before that so it doesn't show any correlation. So that would be the 3rd of June, Tuesday. So today's Saturday and three days on Tuesday, 3rd of June. And then he officially abdicates on Tuesday, the 3rd of June. <laughs> You're astounding, my friend. Just astounding. <laughs> King Juan Carlos was the president, who's the honorary president of the World Wildlife Foundation. That's a cover. King Juan Carlos of Spain was actually, also, actually the president of the Almanac de Gotha which is the record of the parentage of all of the royals, right? And he got that position 
so that he could avoid stating, he'd be in a controlling position to avoid stating that he was the biological father of Prince William of England. Right? You get it? So when I exposed that King Juan Carlos was the biological father of Prince William of England and King Juan Carlos was president of the Royal Almanac de Gotha, which had to record that King Juan Carlos was the biological father of Prince William and therefore Prince William was illegitimate and couldn't be the King of England or the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Then that is why King Juan Carlos had to abdicate. And the fact that he was taken to Africa, shot big game and broke his leg, and then they said Juan Carlos had to abdicate because he shot big game and he wouldn't have been caught unless he broke his leg. That's the cover story. The fact that he was a president of the Almanac de Gotha, was a biological father of Prince William of England and did not record that in the Almanac de Gotha, which just destroys the integrity of the Almanac de Gotha, which is the lineage of royals, and destroy the Spanish kingship. And then it started to expose things like when Juan Carlos was 18, he shot his brother in the face and forehead at point blank range and killed him. Was that an accident? I mean, it sounds rather extraordinary. There's a couple of different points of view on it. And King Juan Carlos has never ever given his point of view. He's never said, but Juan Carlos had just come back from military training and he was being raised by the fascist, General Francisco Franco. So General Francisco Franco might have said, okay, look, I'll give you your kingship as long as you kill your brother. The reason for the condition being? To affirm allegiance to Nazism. Oh, this was a demonstration of his loyalty to Franco. That Franco would tell him to kill his brother, that's certainly an acid test of loyalty. And then he did so, and Franco made him king. Yes. Stunning. Greg, I want to go back just to pick up a few pieces about Jack the Ripper. I never quite grasped exactly how that was playing out and why these women had to die. Well, it's actually kind of interesting because it goes to the bombings of World War II, the last air raid. Prince Eddie, the eldest child of King Edward VII, who was then Bertie, Prince of Wales, and married to Alexandra, Princess of Wales. They had a loveless marriage, absolutely loveless. And the result of their loveless marriage, their first child was born two months premature, and that was Prince Eddie, who looked deformed. He was a bisexual. He was into male prostitutes and female prostitutes, and he smoked Turkish cigarettes, which is code for he smoked marijuana. Uh, and he used to drink, party, hang out of brothels, and he used to sign himself in as in the, in the brothels as P.A.V., Prince Albert Victor, and occasionally he'd sign himself in as Victoria. And he was set up by the Russians and Danish. He got involved with a shop girl and married her in a church that was Catholic or Anglican, in a ceremony that was Catholic or Anglican to a girl who was a Danish Catholic. So it was very likely a Catholic ceremony. And the witnesses were five or six prostitutes. And the celebrant was a guy called Somerset Vec, who was a homosexual prostitute. And that was the St. Saviour's Church, church dedicated to... Uh, First, Martyr Charles I. Prostitutes were all killed because they were witnesses to the wedding. His wife was given a lobotomy by Sir Winston Withy Gull, who was the sergeant surgeon to Queen Victoria and then the sergeant surgeon to Bertie, Prince of Wales, who became King Edward VII. And Prince Eddie's death was fake. He was sent to Glamis Castle, which, which resulted in um, Elizabeth Bell's lion being engaged to a monarch, etc. Um, the true Elizabeth Bell's lion. 
married and moved to France and died in 1950 of a heart condition, which is the same age and cause of death as one of her brothers. At the end of World War II, the British royal family wanted to get rid of this church. All the British high command and all the German high command had each other's phone numbers. And if the British high command wanted something bombed, or the British royalty wanted something bombed, they'd tell the British high command, and they'd actually send the coordinates in to the Germans, who would then blitzkrieg that site. So they tried to blitzkrieg this St. Saviour's Church, and they got all the buildings either side, and then the next night they got the blocks either side. But the church was still standing, and this was the last bombing raids of World War II. So what the British did was actually plant bombs inside the church that Prince Eddie was married in and blew it up after the last bombing raid. Oh, Greg, how uh, awful. Yeah? How absolutely awful. Yeah. Greg, let me bring you to the present, because I personally have looked at this marriage of William and Kate Middleton and I know there's more to the story about Kate and her background. What I'm particularly interested in now is, did she actually bear these children, or did she fake her pregnancy while there was a surrogate carrying the children? Commoner Kate Middleton, who's married to the illegitimate commoner, Prince William. Kate Middleton showed absolutely no signs of pregnancy whatsoever other than a prosthetic pregnancy belly. She had no swollen breasts, she had no swollen ankles, she had no extra weight, she had no puffiness on her face or neck, she had no puffiness around her calves, there was absolutely no baby fat, pregnancy fat, absolutely nothing. And when she came out of the hospital, it appeared to be a rubber baby that was a month old. And Prince William got the rubber baby, brought it out, opened the back door of the car and virtually plonked the baby down. Really? Almost to the point of giving it really? a brain hemorrhage. Yeah, like it was a rubber baby. Kate Middleton came out looking exactly the same as when she went in, having gone through no pain or trauma or even exercise of childbirth. And she was still wearing her pregnancy belly when she came out after the birth. A number of us noticed that. That was picked up by some American tabloids that she seemed to be still pregnant, as it were, when she came out after giving birth, presum uh, presumptively. Just absolute fakery. So that was a rubber baby? It wasn't a real baby? Yeah, at that time it was a rubber baby. It may have been replaced by a surrogate baby. And someone suggested to me that a relative of Camilla Parker Bowles was the surrogate mother. Was this in any way William or Kate's child? No. Not Kate's if it's a surrogate mother, unless they had an ovarian transfer too. Well, what they did when Kate was in hospital is they murdered Jacinta Saldana. And Saldana was the Portuguese diplomat that worked with the Duke of Wellington and actually won the wars for the Duke of Wellington and then was the Portuguese diplomat in London. They murdered Jacinta Saldana because she was Indian, but she had a Portuguese name. And that was sending a message to the Portuguese, which is us, that the British royal family is fake and George is fake. But all of this was told to me in 1967 by King George VI Doctor, who was Lord Arthur Espy Porritt. He was a New Zealander. He got bronze medal in the 100 meter Olympics in 1924. And he was sergeant surgeon to King George VI and to Queen Elizabeth II. And then he came out to New Zealand to become the Governor General. And before he became the Governor General, he had a meeting with me. And I was five and a half at the time, years old, in March 1967. And the couple was, my father was a sharer and a champion sharer. 
And we live about 45 minutes away from Lord Porrett's sheep farm. So he came out to New Zealand in March 1967 and asked my father to share his sheep. And so he shore his sheep. And then on Sunday, it was cold meat sandwiches afterwards for the family, etc. So I'm sitting at my father's knee and Lord Porrett, King George VI doctor, says, why don't you take your son down to Rotorua to see King George VI's son? So about the time that the currency changed from pounds, shillings and pence to decimal currency, which was on the 10th of July, 1967, we went down to Rotorua and we went for a swim and the others went to the shore and I went with my father up to see King George VI's son, who was called George Fitzratima. I spoke to you about this. And he was born in Christmas 1927, and he was the natural-born son of King George VI and a Maori woman called Guy Brangy. So my father shot off, and I had a private meeting with King George VI's son. And because he was the natural-born son of King George VI and was a male he was a superior royal to Queen Elizabeth II, who was a female and not the natural daughter of King George VI. So he was the true king of England, and his name was George. So when William and Kate named their first child George, it was like saying to me, that's the end of the House of Windsor. They can't have a King George VII because I've met him and I was introduced to him by King George VI Sergeant Surgeon and Queen Elizabeth II Sergeant Surgeon, which is probably why the abdicated Queen Elizabeth II has been made my charge. This is all so extraordinary, Greg. I don't believe anyone in the world knows as much about these matters as you. Truly <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. So I take it you believe that the future of the royal family is mm. dim. Well, the House of Windsor is over. Even the judges in England, in the United Kingdom, are fully aware that the House of Windsor is fake. They are absolutely 100% totally aware that the Queen is a fake, that she is flat like royal and not a royal, and never the Queen, and never crowned. And the, the reason Elizabeth married Prince Philip was by extortion. Prince Philip extorted Elizabeth into marriage on the basis that she was an illegitimate non-royal. Prince Philip's a con man, pedophile, Nazi, heroin trafficker, mass murderer, murderer, contract killer. And he even stole my car in London in 2012. Prince Philip stole my car. Greg, he could afford a zillion of them on his well, own. He wanted yours. Well, it's called depleting the resources of the person that exposing sure. the story. London cost me a lot. Yeah. You have no concern the royals coming after you? I mean, you survived multiple assassination tried, attempts. He tried to murder me in the same year in England. And I ended up in the Y Hospital in the borderland between England and Wales. I was in there for two days on morphine on the 5th and 6th of June 2012. But the interesting thing is that the assassin came to the hospital and rang up to get the final order for the execution by Prince Philip. And Prince Philip was in hospital and unavailable on the same two days. <laughs> That can't be a coincidence, right? Well, you know, it's like Prince Philip's controllers are aware, perhaps, of who I am and what I'm doing and that it's true and correct, and they saved me on that basis. Extraordinary. Just extraordinary. You've had any ramifications from your book about blackmail in New Zealand, the guide? And the Actually, I have. Prince Philip's agent in New Zealand who's the Marky boss in New Zealand called Peter Williams QC. He did everything he could to suppress New Zealand, a Black Matters Guide, partially because it exposed him as a heroin trafficker, 
a homosexual whose daughter, Kate Williams, has been a methamphetamine user. So what he did was get his daughter a job in the judiciary, so that was cover. And then they blew up my car several times and they actually physically attacked it. There were about seven police officers involved in attacking my car outside the High Court in broad daylight when I had won the right to appeal the case because I was never invited to the hearing. You mean they took, like, hammers to the vehicle just to smash it up? Yeah. God! Like, it's all about depleting the resources and slowing things down. Peter Aldrich Williams, QC, started off as a bank robber in 1954, 58, and then he moved into heroin trafficking with the Queen Mother, who's actually Elizabeth's mother who's the maid. And that heroin trafficking went on from at least the early 1960s, according to army intelligence, and carried on right through to 1980. And I was actually the target of that heroin because Queen Victoria's psychic said that the person that wrote this up would come from Lemuria. So Prince Philip had his agents around the world, and especially in Lemuria, supplying heroin to the places that the person predicted to write this could be. So Lemuria included New Zealand, and I think that one of the psychics predicted that I would come from the opposite side of the world north, which is using a little conundrum, the opposite side of the world north. So I lived in North Auckland and then North Shore and then North Coat and then North Grove Ave, and then Norton Road, which means North Town Road. So this is the opposite side of the world, north. Prince Philip's agent, Peter Williams, targeted the heroin to all these areas called north, especially North Shore. So I was the target of the heroin. The heroin didn't get to me, but it was destroying the neighbourhoods. And then they had another crack with the methamphetamines, and it still didn't get to me. So they didn't know who I was, but they were targeting me. And so when I got to London, they targeted me by stealing a car, stealing £100,000 and movie rights as well. And didn't allow me access to publish any books or sell any books in any shops or through any chains or to have a literary agent. They blocked the selling of your books throughout the UK? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah completely, yeah, yeah. But they can be obtained through Amazon.com. Yeah, they've, they've also, yes, yeah, they can. And the world of truth.net. The world of truth.net. The world of truth. Yeah, I've done the best. I've had about 14 assassination attempts. And there's others that I haven't really bothered to count. Most of them have written up just as a matter of record. But Peter Eldridge Williams QC, who's the mafia boss in New Zealand, who's Prince Philip's agent, who I expose as the heroin trafficker and methamphetamine trafficker, who murdered. Harvey Internet crew and then accused Arthur Allen Thomas and then got Arthur Allen Thomas off and thus became the hero, getting Arthur Allen Thomas off for the murders that Peter Williams had done. It took 10 years and it kept Peter Williams in the forefront of the legal media from 1970 to 1980. So I exposed him in New Zealand to Black Matters Guide as basically the mafia boss and heroin trafficker and he tried to suppress the book. And the case went on for five years. And then I had a flurry of murder attempts and my car being exploded, bombed. But, but instead of doing an explosion, which is newsworthy, they did implosion. So it was just a huge maintenance bill. It started off as $800 and then it went to $1,500 and then to $8,000, you know. So they blow up the car by destroying the electronics. So it was becoming horrendously expensive to live there. And then I got a loan car just for the day. It's a little Honda Civic. And I took that to the High Court, drove myself there, parked it outside the High Court, went and won the right to appeal. Came out and the mafia boss of New Zealand, Peter Williams, was standing with a detective either side, of him, another two behind him, and there's another detective on the corner of the High Court, another one across the street. So there were six detectives and a retired police officer called Winston West came round on his motor scooter and jumped on the bonnet of my car as I was getting out of the park, the roadside park. While you were in the car? While I'm in the car driving, like, 
you know, doing one right. mile an hour, just, you know, trying to get out. And he ripped the wiper blade and arm right off the car and he ripped the rear vision mirror right off the car. And then it's a Honda Civic, you know, so the bonnet's really low. I've had two Honda Civics, Greg. Yeah, this is like a 1985 thing. It's a lone car. So you can actually sit on the bonnet and your feet can touch the ground or they may be that far off the ground, right? So he's sitting on the bonnet and he falls on the ground. He's got a helmet on, a full motorcycle suit. It's white. Falls on the ground. He waves his arms and legs up in the air, backs on the ground, like a dog wanting to get patted and like he's injured. He's not. These are the local law enforcement authorities who are attacking you. This is law enforcement. And then 20 seconds later, an ambulance picks him up and whisks him away. But the hospital is two minutes' drive away by ambulance. The whole thing was prearranged just as a facade. And then it got so ludicrous. It absolutely won the case by evidence. And it got so ludicrous that they actually had to close down the courts they had no court of record, so there's no record. I had 800 pages of evidence of his heroin trafficking and methamphetamine trafficking and, and pedophilia, etc., and organised pedophilia. And he, this is Prince Philip's agent we're talking about, and the judge suppressed it all. And then the case was delayed for five years and I had all these attacks, including murder attempts and car being imploded. I went overseas for a year and then the case was heard without me being notified, either by email or mail. And then the SIS moved into my house and interfered with my mail, so I didn't get any mail ever again. Greg, all in all, it's fairly astonishing you're still here to do this interview with me today, frankly. I mean, I am just in awe of the history you've led, the threats upon your life, the attempts to kill you, what you've been able to unearth about the royal family, about the whole history of the British monarchy. I am stunned. I am in awe. And I cannot thank you enough for coming on for this interview today. And I look forward to many more, my friend. Yeah, cheers. This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, thanking my special guest extraordinaire, Greg Hallett, for being here and all of you for listening. There is no monarch. House of Winds is over. Because you can't have an illegitimate commoner becoming the monarch.